Hey y'all, I'm Ever Bussy, the program officer for the Just Tech program. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming and welcome to the Just Tech Fellowship Information Session. Just Tech is a program focused on generating a robust ecosystem of researchers and excuse me, practitioners at the intersection of social justice and technology. One of the primary ways we do that is through our Just Tech Fellowship, which we'll be telling you about today. I'm also happy to share that the application for the 2024 cohort of Just Tech Fellows opens today. So it's a good thing that you're here. <laughs> um, just a few things to note. The session will be recorded and shared online. And so you can view later if you'd like. Feel free to leave or come back if you want. Audience screens will not be visible during this session or the recording, so we can't see you. And we won't tolerate disruptors or those engaging in hate-filled or harmful behavior, we will remove you and we'll just keep it moving. Other things to note, we'd like you to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to ask any questions. Live transcript is enabled, so um, you can click the CC icon at the bottom of the screen to access any captions. And just remember that not everyone's first language is English, um, so make sure the questions you answer, uh, the, the questions you ask are clear. Um, to avoid any jargon. Before we jump into things, I want to take this time, I'm excited to take this time to in introduce my team, which consists of Catalina Vallejo, the program director at the Just Tech program. We also have Rodrigo Ugarte, the managing editor of the Just Tech platform. Um, we're joined with Eliana Blom, the program assistant for the Just Tech program and on Doan, another program assistant for the Just Tech program. We're a very small team, um, and I'm really proud of what we've been able to accomplish. Um, know that though you'll be hearing from Kata and myself, Rodrigo, Eliana, and Un <clears throat> are helping things run smoothly behind the, behind the scenes. And so they'll be responding to any questions you have in the chat and making sure the slides run smoothly. And with that, I'll pass the mic to my friend, my colleague, my boss, <laughs> Tata. I think I should be here. I don't know if people can see me, but I'm pretty sure you can hear me. So I'm going to start um, here. So well, first of all, I want to thank everybody to be here for taking the time to be with us today. Um, this is our third call for applications and we're thrilled to be here. Um, we will do our best to answer most of um, your questions. Um, but um, I also want to say that um, if we don't, um, please feel free to email us, to check our newsletter, to check our website, because there will be more information than the one that we can share in the time that we have here. Um, also, Rodrigo and Aneliana are going to be dropping links for more resources that can answer some of your questions. And then at the end of this session, we're also going to have 10 to 15 minutes to answer any other remaining questions. So we are envisioning this as a conversation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a few things. One. Um, I want to start with um, a little introduction of what is the Just Tech program, what is it that we do, what are our goals, um, what type of people and projects we aim to support, and how we do that. And also, I want to brag a little and give you um, some highlights of the work that we've done in the last um, years, um, since we started in 2020. So um, I'm the director. I have the pleasure to be the director for the Just Tech program. Um, our work focuses on centering the perspectives of minoritized and racialized people most impacted by tech harms. We do this, um, the way we do this is through two initiatives. The main one and the one that has us all of us together today is the fellowship, which is um, a commitment on deep investment in non-traditional tech, social justice leaders um, to allow for time for rest, for restoration and radical imagination. And then the second part of our initiative is field building. So we are creating and documenting a network and community of these leaders um, through um, the Just Tech platform, through events, through essays and other content. We will be dropping um, the link to the Just Tech platform because unfortunately we will only be able to support eight fellows. 
but that is um, only one way in which we are working. We would love to collaborate with some of you um, through publishing your pieces, um, to collaborate in events. Um, so the invitation is larger than just um, the fellowship. And now I want to talk a little bit about our goals. And this is a very important part as you put together your application because um, we are looking forward for applicants who can speak directly to these goals, to under who understand them and who whose work engages with them. So the first one is that we want to champion vital investigation into tech's impact and its potential for both harm and benefit. We take a capacious view of research. Uh, we believe that research does take place in universities and they are doing amazing work um, and also by people with PhDs and advanced degrees, but that's not it. Research also takes place in other key spaces like in um, public policy, especially in community organizing, um, in artist practices, um, through litigation by journalists, right? So I'm bringing this up to tell you that the way we think research is um, broader than just writing articles, books, and being in a university, understanding that that job is, is needed, but it's not all. We want to center historically marginalized perspectives, um, highlighting that, as I mentioned before, um, tech has harmed um, these communities the most, not only has brought benefits, but also harm. Um, we want to build and sustain a diverse community of researchers and practitioners. Um, I will talk a little bit more about this, but our community is conformed by people coming from very different backgrounds and very different spaces that usually do not speak to each other. So for us, it's not only about giving people the financial resources that they need to do their work, but also to provide them with a community um, to exchange, to collaborate, to find support um, as they do their important work. And then we also want to reimagine how to invest in people to build and sustain communities of care and collaboration. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we mean by this, but I want to highlight that for us, we are supporting uh, people, not projects. Um, so our approach to this is that we should be aiming uh, for a whole person support. And then we also envision and build, we aim to also envision and build um, toward technological futures that celebrate and manifest justice, agency, knowledge, and joy. And with this, what we mean is that we believe that change is possible and that things can be a different way than they are right now. Now, I wanna talk about what the Just Tech Fellowship <clears throat> supports so you get a better sense of how we work with our fellows. Um, this is direct funding to individuals who do not award organizations and that's not gonna change, but we are not thinking about individuals who live in isolation. We're thinking about individuals who are part of larger communities of practice. Um, the fellows get to decide what to do with the money. So if they want to root their funds to their organization, that's possible to people that they collaborate with, that's possible. We do not ask um, for any control over that. But I want to be very clear that we're funding individuals. Um, as I mentioned before, we believe in a collaborative community. So not only you get the funding, but in exchange of that, we expect you to be an active member of our community, to engage with the other fellows, to participate in events, um, to talk to us, to collaborate with us. And then we have supplementary funding for the whole person support. And the way this works and the way um, we imagine this is that, um, can we move to the next slide, please? So the Just Tech program administers two year awards of $100,000 per year. And that award um, is augmented, not restricted, you decide what to do with the money. And that um, award is augmented by robust supplementary funding that can go up to $30,000. And this is supplementary funding that goes directly to the person. We do not route this fund through organizations. Um, the main award, we can do that in a specific cases. But what we are thinking is that people will use this money for dependent care, for healthcare, for workspace, for technical equipment, for project materials, communications, and other needs. So this comes from us understanding that people, again, not only need money to do the project, um, they need also funding and money to be able to cover basic needs and expenses for them and for the people that they care about and for the communities that they are part of. Um, so this is what we mean by whole person um, support. Now, I want to talk um, a little bit about who are the Just Tech Fellows. And this is a very important part because our community is very diverse and is very diverse um, intentionally. Um, we want to open a space for people coming from very different backgrounds, people who usually will not overlap in the world together, um, um, to work um, um, together 
and to share the work that they are doing, right? So what happens when we pair an artist with a journalist? What happens when we pair a community organizer with a um, professor? And so we welcome people, we welcome researchers from different backgrounds, we welcome artists, we welcome journalists, we welcome uh, legal scholars, lawyers, organizers, and more. Um, and this is at the core of the work that we do. Um, now, I wanna share a little bit about highlights. And um, I've been part of this program since um, its inception in 2020, we've learned a lot. Um, we are always welcoming your feedback as an applicant and as a fellow to make our application better. Um, but I wanna take this spot to highlight what we've done in the last year to uplift the work of our fellows and for you to get a sense of what happens when you are part of this community. So we have gone back Thankfully, to in-person gatherings, we had the fortune to meet um, the fellows in upstate New York, New York City, and more recently in, pa in, in Puerto Rico. And um, these are spaces in which many things happen, but one of them is that the fellows got to know each other, um, got to work with each other, and got to dive more into the question of what is just tech, what will constitute just technology, and build to that, towards that. And then our fellows have been publishing in many places like the Atlantic, Wire, Washington Post, and also uh, our Just Tech platform. I'm very grateful for their contributions to that. Our fellows have been recognized by multiple organizations and um, institutions. And here there are only two examples, South by Southwest and also the National Endowment for the Humanities. And then um, we collaborated with Measure that is led by our 2022 fellow um, Mimi Styles and putting together a panel on Afrofuturism in Austin during South by Southwest. Um, and we're very proud of that. So all of these are just a little, a few highlights of um, the fellowship for you to get a sense of what is the work that we do and how we take care of our community and what the fellows get to do. And now I wanna pass it back to Ever. And thank you. I'm back, everyone. Um... So we could go on and on about the fellowship, but we thought it'd be better to have actual fellows share their experiences. Um, and so we've invited two members of the 2023 cohort, and I'm really honored to be able to introduce them. The first is Tawana Honeycomb Petty. Tawana is a Detroit-based artist, organizer, and poet who spent years in organizing and educating Black folks on matters related to the expanding surveillance and policing infrastructure. After years grinding for others, Honeycomb finally has time to focus on her own ambitions as a Just Tech fellow. She's currently working on a collaborative, immersive exhibition on safety and surveillance. And with that, I'm just so proud to be able to give you Tawana Honeycomb Petty. Thank you. Thank you, Ever. Um, so I'm not able to start my video, but hope you all can hear me. I am. Okay, here we go. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. I, I'm deeply honored to be a Just Tech fellow. And so I have a short window. So I want to cover as much as possible. Uh, my background, I've known I was a poet for about 40 years. Uh, I'm, I'm giving you all my age to a degree. Uh, I've been engaged in narrative justice work for nearly 20 years and uh, engaged in digital and data justice related work for over a decade, as well as served as a community researcher for about the last 15 years off and on various projects. And the Just Tech Fellowship is the first time in my life in decades that I am able to combine all of my worlds into one space and show up as my full, creative, curious self. Uh, it removed all those parameters. Like I feel like I've been able to like just shed all of the you know inhibitions that keep you from being like whole uh, and contributing your talents, and it lets you bloom in a way that I've just not had the opportunity to do. I've done a lot of meaningful work. I've had some really great jobs, but this is the first time. Uh, that I'm able to say, you know what, I don't have to put poetry to the side. I don't have to put data justice to the side. I can actually be all of those things. And so I was really motivated 
to join the Just Tech Fellowship because I was looking for that creative outlet. I was looking for that opportunity uh, to allow myself to think outside the box creatively. Um, and I'll just tell you a bit about the application process. It was, uh, honestly, it was the most effortless application that I've experienced when trying to apply for a fellowship or grant, et cetera, right? Those are very onerous type applications where you know you you feel like you've given your blood sweat and tears and um and it's still not enough i felt like this application process allowed me to just be my full self to be honest within the artist statement or the you know the statement that uh, i had to contribute to talk about my background in honest ways i didn't feel like i had to cold switch i felt like i could really be genuine about what my goals are and what I feel most passionate about. And um, and so although I wasn't, you know, I felt really good about the application, which doesn't make you feel like you're automatically going to get the fellowship. But I will tell you that even had I not gotten a fellowship, I felt like this application process helped me to think through my work in a different way, which I really, really appreciate it. But when I got the call, I will tell y'all that I ran through my home for like an hour screaming. Um, and then when I finally calmed myself down, I called my family and then swore them to secrecy. So um, it was life changing. It was a life changing moment. Uh, I felt decades of angst just kind of melt away off my shoulder um, because I knew that this would be a space for me to bloom creatively in ways that I had honestly been suppressing um, in other opportunities that I've had. And so a couple of highlights that I want to name about being part of this fellowship uh, was the opportunity to go to Puerto Rico. Number one, it's a beautiful and amazing place, but I was able to build what I hope are lifelong friendships uh, through the fellowship. And so these are my comrades now, uh, some of which I knew just inside the computer screen, others I had never met before. We all have vastly different projects, but we're all uh, trying to create a goal of uh, a better society, the ones that we believe we deserve. And so the fellowship allows you this opportunity to really get rooted and deep dive on these relationships. So it's it's honestly unlike anything that I have ever ex uh, experienced in my life. And then I'll finally say, um, I have been able to have a sort of freedom that has allowed me in this space to take uh, my artist organization, which was a fiscally sponsored project since 2016, and I've now turned it into a nonprofit. So what I hope to be able to continue to do uh, throughout the fellowship and beyond is to explore what my organization can become. Uh, it's art justice, it's narrative work, it's ethical tech, it's you know data and digital justice, it's deep diving on consentful uh, practices and it allows me to collaborate with residents in my city and beyond uh, in ways that I didn't have the freedom uh, and opportunity to do without these resources uh, from the fellowship. And so I hope that um, the ways that I'm sharing this uh, is helpful to you. I'll just say, be your full self. Don't create, as was already said, don't make up something to try and get the resources. This is an opportunity to be your full self uh, and to engage with this uh, process in ways that you've not been given the opportunity to do before. Thank you. Thank you, Tawana. Um, Tawana and I are both Detroiters, and so I hopefully will see more of her when I go home for the holidays. Um, but next, <laughs> but next, I'm excited to, to excuse me to introduce Jay Little Cunningham. Jay is another one of our 2023 cohort members. Um, Jay is an early career computer scientist and public interest technologist at the University of Washington. Jay is focused on advancing more responsible design of automated systems that impact Black people. And I, yeah, will pass the mic to Jay. Awesome, there we go. Hopefully people can see me, hear me, is that working? Awesome, awesome. Um, well, I am super excited to 
um, just be here today and just to chat more about my experiences as just a like fellow. Um, again, my name is Jay Cunningham, um, and I am currently a um, doctoral candidate at the University of Washington, um, wrapping up my fifth year working on my dissertation. Um, and I do a lot of research at the intersection of um, equitable AI and machine learning, specifically looking at the experiences and impact in AI on Black communities. Um, much of my research has kind of settled in what I call linguistic justice and speech recognition for Black um, American English speakers, and also research in aspects of like facial recognition and what I call uh, cultural community data. Um, and looking at how that data appears in AI systems. Um, as I mentioned, I am call myself a public interest technologist, um, but that really means inside of my work and research, I take these pretty uh, unconventional human-centered approaches to involving communities in the work that I do. So even though I am a scientist and I have a almost PhD, um, I don't believe that I'm just the beholder of knowledge and I don't know everything. And I do work on and with communities. And that means involving people in the processes that we do. Um, and much of my you know, work and research thus far, I've had a chance to work with local um, like black led community organizations in the Seattle area. Um, specifically organizations that have already been doing social justice um, um, advocacy and issues around civil rights and equity, but many of these issues surround, um, you know, education, food insecurity, um, social justice from a safety aspect, but um, I'm originally from Northeast Mississippi. I'm a rural boy, grew up in the Deep South, and issues of social justice have always been um, really close to me and my communities. But as someone who is now in technology, I found that there can be a disconnect with how communities even see themselves being engaged in with topics surrounding uh, technology advocacy or communities not feeling like they, they know enough or equipped enough to be at the intersection of these conversations. Um, and I just beg to differ. Uh, and so I really got motivated to apply for the Just Take Fellowship actually after meeting um, one of the first, co first cohort fellows, Mimi Styles. I actually did a research study and Mimi was inside of a study that I did. Um, and this study kind of explored the experiences of community organizations that worked with um, tech companies um, and what that experience was like and how either tech companies either exploited or honored their organizations. Um, and Mimi kept mentioning Just Tech. And I'm like, well, so what is this program that you keep mentioning? And she was like, you know, you should apply for this program. Um, and it's been an experience like no other. Again, as, um, as an academic, I have the uh, experience of applying for like, a number of like research grants from the, the National Science Foundation um, and a number of different sources, but this is in no way the same as any of those experiences. Um, as Honeycomb mentioned, um, the application process is one that was super self explorative you know typically i'm writing you know uh, research grant proposals that are like you know thousands of words multiple pages this was 500 words y'all in the video and it actually got me back i think to the core um of like my i think maybe i would say true self i feel like sometimes like when you're doing research writing you kind of have to like dress it up you're gonna have to say what you think people want you to say and this experience wasn't really like that. I actually got a chance to, in so many ways, take off my academic like hat and say like, hey, why did I get started in doing this work anyways? Um, and it's because of the work that I do with my communities. It's because of the work that I love to do. And I had a chance to actually exercise some of that creative writing that I used to do maybe back in high school. Um, and it's an experience that I, again, love that I had because even if I didn't get the Just Take Fellowship, I think I came out of the application process just being like, you know what, like there's purpose in the work that I do. And it doesn't always have to um, sound good to certain people. It doesn't always have to appease certain folks. Um, and so those things for me um, have been pretty dynamic in this experience thus far. Um, my highlights thus far being a Just Tech fellow, uh, Honeycomb mentioned we just came back from a retreat in Puerto Rico, y'all. And that was a great time. Um, but the Just Tech fellowship has a model that truly I've never seen before. Um, I think it took me a while to realize that this is a fellowship that truly supports uh, people. Um, like Kata and Ever has mentioned, this is not a fellowship where you, the investment is just in your project, it's in you. And so myself um, coming from a uh, historically, you know, uh, low income background, I'm, I'm, I've been a graduate student, but if anybody knows anything about going to grad school, PhD student salaries are literally poverty. And so, 
uh, to have a, a program to want to sponsor and support me during my time as a fellow is just life changing. It's actually, again, it took me a while to even consume and understand that like the investment is in my vision and just check the SSRC and our, uh, and our donors, they support what we are doing. And so whether that is what I initially propose and whether that changes over time, it's okay because it's all about them believing in the things that I'm doing. Um, I'm coalition building. I'm developing an organization of technologists, um, of scholars and researchers. Um, maybe some of you here in the audience are interested in uh, supporting communities and the work that we're trying to do to counteract, you know, um, harmful um, harmful experiences in AI. And so I'm building a network of practitioners, community members that actually want to come together and solve problems, um, you know, depending on, you know, what your skills are and what your interests are. And I think that, um, I guess in closing, um, what I would say that my time as a Justice Fellow will continue to have um, or continue to spend is, you know, we have so many great resources like our Just Take platform. Again, I'm so used to writing in like academic journals and publishing, uh, you know, peer reviewed journal articles, but we have an amazing platform that allows us to share the work that we do. We get to collaborate with one another. So, so many of the Just Take Fellows, we, again, we have researchers, we have artists, we have attorneys. And so it's great to like combine our brains and think about writing and producing information and content that is genuine and true to us, not having to worry about if it is feasible for an academic journal, whether someone will like it or not. We do this because we love to do what we do and we want our voices and perspectives to be heard in our work. And so having a place that we're able to do that, I think is pretty transformative. And so I'm looking forward to continuing to build my relationships across my peers and other fellows. Um, and as the most uh, junior Just Tech fellow, I think someone maybe asked this, uh, I'm the youngest fellow. And so we we realized this back here at the Puerto Rico trip. Um, and uh, my other fellows did not let me forget that. But I think that, you know, in my experience thus far, it's not about whether you are senior in your career. It's not about whether you are mid-career. I'm early, I'm just getting started in my career. And so to have a program like this support me and put me directly in community with people who are in different phases, I think um, will only support the work that I continue to do. So thank y'all for coming. Thanks for listening to me talk. And I hope that y'all apply. Thanks everyone. Back again. I wanna thank both Jay and Tawana for taking, for taking the time. Um, they'll both be around for the Q&A portion. And so you have any questions, if you have any questions for them specifically, um, they'll be around to answer them. So I'm sure people are wondering or asking themselves, like, what do we mean by technology? I think that's a great question. Um, being a person who studied technology for a minute now, um, I kind of love how broad the definition can be. So I think of language as a kind of technology, but for the sake of this fellowship, we are focusing on the novel kind of digital emergent technology. And so this ranges from artificial intelligence to surveillance technology, augmented, excuse me, augmented or virtual reality tools, the internet, but also the sciences and techno science of, for things like genetic engineering. Who can apply for this fellowship? So we are looking for those working at the working at and exploring the intersection of tech and social justice, um, whether you come from that, come at that intersection through art, journalism, community organizing, social justice, or computer science, we, we want you, we want all of you. Um, you must be based in the US during your the fellowship period, that's important. And you must also be able to demonstrate your familiarity with a particular field of research and practice by possessing experience and a track record in that field. Um, you do not, you are not required to have a formal degree. You just need to demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and most importantly, the focus needs to be on social justice and technology. As you're filling out your application, you should ask yourself a few questions. Is this aligned with the goals of the fellowship? Can the scope of work be accomplished in two years? Is the purpose of the project clear? What is the potential for public impact? What are the ethical considerations being made related to the project? Is there potential to collaborate with other fellows or community groups? And how will the project alter the trajectory of the field it belongs to? 
Um, so specifics about the application, like I mentioned, um, yay, the application opened today, I think it was around like 9 a.m. Uh, it will close January 31st at 1159 p.m., which means you have over two months to complete it. So just keep that in mind. The eligibility and selection process will happen between February and April of 2024. And we will be awarding the fellowship to eight awardees who will be notified in May of 2024. The fellowship will kick off in August. In August, the real fun will begin. Um, as a program officer, I have the opportunity uh, to design programming for the fellows to grow professionally as researchers and practitioners, um, but also personally and communally as people with a rare opportunity to think deeply, create, and kind of just be in a, in a world in the conditions that support and encourage their humanity. That's really important to me. Um, this looks like monthly sessions, called, we like to call these community calls where fellows can build relationships with each other. Um, we also offer one -on regular one-on-one -on -one check-ins with each fellow. Um, so the fellows have the opportunity to connect intimately with me or Kata um, so, they can, so we can hear more about the kind of specifics they would want or need uh, for, their, for a successful fellowship. In this photo, you see just like fellows at our Puerto Rico retreat, where the fellows and staff got to meet in person and engage in relationship building activities, but also relax and to celebrate um, and celebrate the work being done. And with that, I am going to open it up to questions for myself, Kata, Jay, and Tawana. I want to answer one question that we have in the chat, and I then want to invite also Jay and Tawana to uh, contribute to this one. And is could you provide insights into the distribution of applications in the Justec program? And specifically, I'm interested in understanding the ratio of early career applicants compared to the selection of mid and late career recipients in the cohort. Um, we have a lot of variety on that, and. Um, Jay, I'm bringing you this to this conversation because you are the youngest. <laughs> Some people was actually asking for your age, which you are not. Um, you don't have to answer that for sure. For sure, that. no. Um, yeah. But um, I mean, for two things that I want to highlight here before I pass it to Tawana and Jay is we're thinking about age doesn't matter, and what we're thinking about here is people with a trajectory. Um, this is not a project that you just imagine to apply for the fellowship. You have to show a track record that you've done this. Some people have done it in the context of universities getting a PhD and other people have done it through community organizing. Um, so that would be my answer, but I want to invite you, Jay and Tawana, to, to add to that. You know, thanks for mentioning that. I mean, so it's funny because I almost did not apply or I was discouraged to almost apply um personally because of my age I actually thought that maybe I wouldn't have enough experiences or like expertise um and I thank god that that did not happen um like you know as Kata mentioned like it's about having a track record I think that because I had some you know professional experiences of being a, you know a software engineer and product manager um from being a community organizer and working a lot with nonprofits to now my experiences as an academic and researcher like I was able to bring I think my whole self to this application process and you know in the words of late John Lewis if not you then who if not now then when and so the worst that people could have told me was no and if that no was and if that hadn't been the case we probably would have just came back next year um and so I think that like you know reflecting on what is unique about you and your experiences right and not once thus far and I don't think this will happen in my time as a just like fellow that I've even still felt like um my because of my age you know or because I'm early in early career that my peers don't like respect me or that they don't care about what I say I think most times I think uh, when we got a chance to meet in person uh we started talking I think I mentioned my age and everyone looked at me like we thought you were much older because you act so much older we would have never guessed that you were older so, you were uh, younger so I think just putting that into perspective that age ain't nothing but a number we care about you and care about what you want to bring to our community Yes, and I will touch and agree with everything Jay said. 
And then just say, as someone who has a couple decades over Jay, I'm learning every day from Jay, right? And so um, these intergenerational spaces that allow you to like, like I'm re I I'm getting some vibrancy and learning from younger generations about how they're experiencing the world and how they're showing up in the world. And then I hope that there is some wisdom from years of experience that I can also uh, contribute. And so it's the egos are checked at the door. We're all in the learning journey together. Um, as was indicated, there are a lot of novel new technologies and systems that are being innovated every day. So in that regard, we're all learning at the same time because these systems are being created newly every day. And so it's going to take a village of differing ages, differing mentalities, uh, mindsets, and creative energy to create the society we all deserve. And so we're not showing up in the space going, oh, well, I've been here for, you know, this long. And then what's this person doing here? The actual part of justice <laughs> um, that is in the Just Tech Fellowship is that we are creating a world that's different than a lot of the other worlds that preface hierarchy um, and create situations where certain folks' voices are marginalized. That's not the society that we're creating within the fellowship. And so folks who apply should be thinking about that. Like, how do you show up uh, as a perpetual student who wants to learn from everyone and don't come in thinking that you have all of the answers already defined? The other you, thing that I, I wanna bring, um, we're getting many questions about how to use the money. And um, we have, um, I. First of all, I want to invite you to read carefully the call for applications because uh, many of those questions are answered there and there is even more information than the one that we can share in this space. I also want to invite you to check the frequently asked questions and I also want you to check the Just Tech platform for different reasons. Many of you are asking, what are the current fellows doing? What type of projects do you support? I think the best example is not only to have, I mean, I'm grateful for the time that Jay and I want to put into it here, but also that you check what the other fellows are doing. Um, you will check, you will see in um, the just a platform from their profiles what their projects are about. Um, so you get a better sense of what type of projects we are supporting. And now I just want to highlight something. When we say unrestricted, it's unrestricted. You get to do with the money what you want. You spend it the way you want. Um, we do allow for people to root, root the main fellowship through their institution if needed. Uh, for because people sometimes want to do that because if they are part of a university, but the supplementary funding goes directly to you. So all the questions about can I pay collaborators, can I pay university fees, it's up to you. You know, uh, you decide what to do with the money. Um, it's not or um, yeah, it's not what we do. Um, I don't know if Jay and Tawana, do you want to add anything about your experience of using the funds <laughs> to clarify to people? Listen, I live in Seattle, and it's expensive to live and exist here. Um, and uh, again, getting the the funds has been again they're unrestricted, they're gifts. Um, and so, again, for me, I've typically been used to applying for like research grants from like the government, where like you have to use those funds exclusively for equipment, for material. Um, I work a lot with communities. Um, I actually just I'm starting a project now with some community partners here in Seattle. Um, I actually just uh, gifted like $10,000 to some of my community organizations that I'm working with just as like a, again, gift to them. So even stewarding and distributing these funds back into the communities that I'm working with was really important for me um, is I think this principle of not being extractive in the work that we're doing and committing to community. And so there's, you know, typically it's, it will be really hard for me to justify doing that type of activity with like institutional grant money. But with this fellowship, I can do that. And it's great to have and it's flexible and also supports me. Um, and as I wrap up my, you know, uh, my graduate school experience, um, and as I look toward the next kind of chapters, this is giving me such safety and security and freedom to do that. And I think so many choices um, in my life, because of my upbringing and background, has been motivated by uh, financial stability. Um, and so not having that be the thing that is defining what I do and how I do it, um, again, has been like life changing for me just in this last like few months. And so I'm just thankful for the freedom to explore things and do what I want to do with those funds. 
Yes. And similarly to Jay, like it's given me opportunities to resource local artists um, in ways, you know, artists that are newly coming into their creative capacity who want to think about things like how you deconflate surveillance with safety and like resourcing first time workshop presenters. Right. Um, and so in addition to paying like my day to day expenses, like I had an artist that I uh, secured to facilitate a workshop series with 12 other artists yesterday tell me like I didn't tell you that was the first time I ever got an opportunity to facilitate a workshop by myself. And I said, well, I saw it in you, you know, and so it just really gives you that freedom to pay it forward, right? And then I'll just very frankly and personally say the supplemental funds have allowed me to pay for a COBRA medical insurance, <laughs> um, if I'm real. And so it's like, uh, you know, for two years, I don't have to worry about how I'm my medical insurance is being paid. And so, you know, it really does unrestricted literally means do what you want to do with the resources, just as long as you're staying committed to the goals of helping to create this more just tech society, how you spend the money is totally up to you. We have another question that I want to also invite you, Jay, and I wanted to talk about it. I think I um, explained a little bit about this at the beginning, which is and I want to emphasize this, we do not accept applications from groups of people, organizations, because we are developing a model of funding of the whole person. So we only support individuals. But again, these individuals are um, immersed in larger communities. And um, we are getting a question about their recommendation to acknowledge a collaborator's participant on the fellowship project application, yes. Uh, but please be aware that the money will go directly to you and or participate in an organization you would like to collaborate with. So the thing that I wanna um, invite the two of you to do, because I'm pretty sure many people in this call know the amazing work that you do, but some people might not, is that if you can talk a little bit more about what are the larger communities that you are part of and that you work with and for. So I can start. Um, so I'm based in Detroit, uh, rooted in Detroit, but I do do a lot of work uh, nationally and globally. Um, and I will say that um, I'm able to take the lessons that I'm learning. Uh, one part of this process is that I'm creating some popular education materials. Uh, I convene workshops um, that don't just center Detroiters, but also leverage the lessons learned from Detroit uh, on a national perspective. And so I'm able to also travel to different conferences um, and participate in workshops and other spaces that have similar, experiencing similar issues that we are experiencing. And so uh, my late mentor, Grace Lee Boggs would always say, what time is it on the clock of the world? And so I'm always thinking about like, what time is it on the clock of the world? And then how do we learn from the, the experiences that we're having and apply those in ways that other communities can learn from, and then we can cross share those skills. And so Although I am rooted and very place-based, I know that what's happening in Detroit is a microcosm of what's happening in other places. And so that's what I try to leverage uh, all the opportunities that I have um, to contribute to. And so hopefully um, that answers the question. And then I just want to briefly say, think uh, I want you all to think about, and I'm going to use myself as a personal example. If you are leaving a job, um, as I did, you have to think about that this, it, these, these are your funds. So, <laughs> so you do have to have a mindset of like how you're going to pace out. Like you can't, you, I wouldn't ball out of control. Like when you get a lump sum of my money, uh, I would, I would look at this as, you know, this is, these are resources to sustain yourself as well as contribute to the work. And so that's just my, you know, that's probably the mom and me giving some extra advice, but I, I do want to say that like, if you are going to make the decision to leave a, 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 a job, um, I, I'm all for it because that's what I chose to do. Um, but then you just, just be responsible in how you balance out those resources. But Just Tech is not going to tell you to do that. This is my personal advice as a human being that wants to see you thrive uh, and use this opportunity to create a just future for yourself individually. No, uh, thanks, Wanda, for like even sharing that. And um, I mean, echoing so much of what you shared because you have the flexibility. Um, we get lump sum payments. Uh, and so I don't know about y'all, but I've never seen that much money at once. Um, and 
I um and, and stewing those is really critical. And I think like, you know, some of the fellows, there's other fellows who are professors currently. Um, they're like kind of the ones that I kind of, you know, mirror myself with and I kind of see like, okay, how are you doing this? Cause you're maybe full time, well, technically I'm full time in academia as well. But I even know one of our fellows, um, like uh, Rua Williams, uh, talks about how even to expand her work, she's doing stuff like funding PhD students um, to even support the work that she's doing. So again, like she couldn't have applied on behalf of like her institution, but because Rue is one of our fellows, she gets to steward their funds to maybe other students that she's supporting or mentoring to even push her agenda and her contributions forward. Um, as someone who is a PhD student, I know how important that is. So even recognizing the impact that she's able to have on on her emerging students and scholars is great. And I think one thing that I think I'll, I'll mention, um, when Kata and I first met, we met at a conference in Germany, uh, and I was in Germany giving a comp giving a talk at uh, ACM Chi uh, Computing for Human Interaction, um, and I gave a talk on anti blackness and computing and like solidarity and what it means to produce and try to solve issues related to anti blackness through technology. And I remember Kasa and I were just talking, and she's like, "Are you Jay?" And we she had a chance to come and meet me, and I was so excited about that. And during this talk, I talked about some of the work that I was doing with my local communities, and when it came to doing participatory work or public interest work. And one thing that I distinctively mentioned was that we have the privilege, again, this is my place as an academic PhD land with other scholars who've been around, probably much older than me and much more experienced. I've always had this maybe slight kind of disdain when it came to deep academic research because it positions us as the you know, capstone beholder of knowledge. And the communities that I work with, whether it is um, the Urban League or, or in here in Seattle, we have King County Equity Now. There's so many community-based organizations, but they don't come to these, they're not in these spaces. They're not producing this academic work that we consider in my space to be so impactful and critical. What this fellowship is actually allowing me to do is actually go to places and be in the spaces that I think my work is the most impactful in, or even trying to support them and bring them into some of the work. So even for the same conference that's coming up next year, um, I'm planning to sponsor like one of my um, like community organizations to actually attend an academic conference. So trying to bridge like community and like scholarship um, or trying to dismantle these notions and these power uh, dynamics of like, again, myself being an academic and knowing more than other people. Um, and so the fellowship has allowed me to use those funds to go to conferences like, you know, Afrotech or Black in Tech or um, community based or maybe more local or regional experiences where the folks that I see me collaborating with um, outside of my academic space, <clears throat> they are. And it's important for me to put myself in those spaces, too. I now want to invite Ever to talk a little bit more about the programming. Um, we're getting some questions about what type of things do fellows will have access to if um, eligible. As I mentioned before, the first one is the fellowship award. That is $100,000 of unrestricted funds a year and then uh, for two years and then supplementary funding. And then we also have funding for collaborations. For example, two of our fellows recently put a panel. Uh, for Afro Tech, uh, Mimi Styles and Clarence Oko, and then Jay was also there. Um, but Ever, if you can talk a little bit more about what is the experience of being part of the um, of the fellowship. Sure. So the question I'm seeing is, I'm curious about the kind of activities that fellows get to participate in. For instance, is there a sort of mentorship throughout the program to help fellows think through and achieve their project? Um, so. As the program officer, like I mentioned, I have the liberty of designing what the fellows get to do. Um, but that is the approach that Kata and I have decided to take is for there to be a lot of room. So we're not like constantly meeting every week. Um, we give the fellows the kind of space to um, use their funding and like use this opportunity and as they see fit largely. But we do have like regular convenings each month um, and one-on-one -on -one sessions. Within those regular group convenings though, we have uh, what's called a speaker series where we invite different like experts to come and like share expertise and insights with our fellows on different topics. Um, one of our recent ones was with Anongo Lumumba Kasongo, who's a professor at 
Brown, um, and who's doing really, really fascinating work with um, AI and speech recognition, but like through like hip hop and like songwriting and things like that, um, to come and talk about the intersection of art and technology and like the political implications, but also like the kind of exciting avenues that are emerging in those areas. Um, another was Matt Mitchell from Crypto Harlem, who actually came to talk to our fellows about um, fellowship opportunities that they could use and how they could use this opportunity to leverage other fellowships down the line. Um, as far as mentorship, if that is something you're interested in, you could you would ideally tell Cops and myself that in our one-on-one -on -one sessions. And so you could use those sessions as ways to, I don't know, get targeted um, resources from us if you are interested in a specific thing, if you if you have a specific idea for how you want to use these two years, you would communicate that and we would kind of um, curate this experience and so you are achieving or accessing those things. And one thing I feel pretty confident in my own ability and Kata's ability to provide is a larger network. So we can, so as members of Just Tech, we have, uh, and because we have the Just Tech platform, we have access to a lot of people who are interested in collaborating with our fellows. Um, and we are more than happy to introduce y'all to these people. Kata, do you think I'm missing anything? No, now I want to pass it to Jay, who's going to answer the following question. The fellowship projects are meant to be completed in two years. Um, with this, I want to highlight again that we are supporting the person or the project. You have to submit a project um, and tell us what portion of that project is going to be completed in two years. But we also welcome change. So if people change their project during their tenure, that's also welcome. And then the rest of the question says, I'm curious how our work can continue to have impact after our tenure. Is our giving justice is going is ongoing work? We agree with you. Um, the fellowship will be just one step to do that, but then you decide what happens after that. Come some fellows answer how they see their impact continuing after the end of their project. Um, so I'm gonna pass it to Jake and to Tawana. What do you think is gonna happen after the fellowship? I mean, you have plans. We are not fortune tellers, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is interesting. I mean, you know, I'm we're just getting started, but I know the first cohort is, you know, people were reflecting at our retreat, like, oh, what do I do when I'm done? Um, first of all, like, I see this as the inception and I was joking with them like, oh, y'all have messed up because now you can never get rid of me. Um, and I think I see this as just like, I don't know, for me, a career long um, community that I'll be able to have. What I'm excited to see is to see five, 10 years down the road when there are so many of us that have been in these spaces and to see the impact in the community that we create. Um, I think over the, you know, over my two years, I have my work plans for my, for my, for the fellowship and we even submit updates on what we're doing. But again, it's, it's dynamic and you're able to change those things. And so I think for me, what it actually has done is kind of really alleviate some of like the pressure and maybe the stress sometimes that like arbitrary, like, you know, deadlines or like demands make you feel and allow me to think around like, oh, wow, like how do we genuinely make progress towards what it is that I want to, you know, do or contribute? Um, but I think that, you know, again, you know, we have stuff like, you know, men we get peer mentors, so we get matched with mentors from the, the cohort previously. And that's been amazing as a new fellow um, and hearing what they've done in just their first year. And as we all strategize for our next year and as they talk about what they're going to do, like when they off board uh, after being a fellow, we're like, well, even when you're not a fellow, you still got those of us that will still be here. So there's really just no way of losing this community. So that makes me excited. Yeah. And, um, and I'll just say again, like, um, I, I had the courage to turn my fiscally sponsored project into a nonprofit. <laughs> um, I don't know if that was, I don't know how smart that was yet. I'm figuring it out, but the fact that I have the space to figure it out. Right. Um, and so hoping to continue to leverage this network, uh, which I'm calling family. Like I'm telling you, we were only together a few days and I left there feeling like this is like my family. And so, um, so, you know, deepening the collaborative work with the existing fellows, not just from this cohort, but from the previous cohort, and hopefully some of you in the future cohort, um, and doing some collaborative writing, um, and yeah, just building out the organization. But I'm so excited to figure out like what it's going to be like. I feel like I've never in my life 
had the freedom to explore like this. And so I don't even want to set parameters over it. Like, I just feel like I'm going to, if I want to do it and try it, I'm going to do it and try it. And so, and so, you know, next year might look totally different than this year, but, um, but those barriers have been lifted. And so that I don't, I just, I can't name how important that is, especially for someone, like I said, who's been in the workforce in the job system for over 30 years. Um, and so to now have this opportunity to say the sky is literally the limit. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I yeah, just watch. <laughs> That's all I could say. Thank you both. I'm going to take this time to close us out. Um, I first want to say thank you to Jay, Honeycomb, and Kata for holding things down. And for my folks behind the scenes, <laughs> all my besties, um, Eliana, Rodrigo, on, and Eugene, who handled everything on the tech side, thank you so much for your support. Um, thank you for all the attendees for coming. Again, this recording is going to be online, so you can watch it later. Um, the application opens today on November 17th and closes again January 31st at 11.59 p.m. We hope to see your application. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for coming. And here's to a successful and prosperous cohort for 2024. Thank you all.